Welcome to another edition of the Litigation Psychology Podcast brought to you by Courtroom Sciences. Dr. Steve Wood, excited uh, about today's podcast. Uh, this this is a, a guest that I've been trying to get on for a little bit. I wanted to talk to him. So excited to have him on with us today. I'm talking to Will Studi. Will Studi is from Oric Harrington in Sutcliffe out of Washington, D.C. Will, how are you? I'm great, Steve. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, like I said, I brought you on to to talk to you about a case, but at the same time, I want to spend some time really going through and learning about how does Will Studi work up his cases, because as you'll see as we go throughout, you know, you, you, you do some things that are very, very good that I think a lot of attorneys can learn from. So that's one of the main reasons why I wanted to bring you on. But I really just want to kind of start with, you know, who, who is Will Studi? You know, how did you get here? What, how did you get in the profession and kind of what's your background? Thank you for asking. Um, yeah, it's interesting, Not uh, maybe a different path than many. So I'll start at the very beginning. I grew up with a single mother and, you know, have a biracial family. My father's African-American and my mother's German and Native American. We grew up in Minneapolis. So I grew up without a father in the home. My mother raised me. Uh, God bless her soul. She passed away about uh, 12 years ago. Uh, but she was a, a fantastically tough single mother and we grew up uh those of us i'm dating myself now but we were called latchkey kids because you know you had a key around your neck on a on a string that's how you got in the house because mom was still working after school i think you'd probably get in trouble for what what they did uh today back then but uh so 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 that's where i started uh in my very humble beginnings my mother was a didn't graduate from college i'm not only the first person in my immediate family to graduate college but i also to go on to law school uh, so I learned several things from her in that experience that I think really helped me. And one of them is, you know, grit and being, uh, you know, not afraid of taking on challenging things and, and the value of hard work. I've had a job since I was 14 and I started detasseling corn in Minneapolis, which is a job I wouldn't wish on anybody. And, you you know, you get scraped up all over your arms from the very sharp corn stalks. And it's a very difficult summer job. But I did that for a couple of summers. And then I worked in restaurants. And I started washing dishes. And by the time I went to high school, there was an Italian restaurant um, that I worked at and uh, old school Italians. And I think uh, they're both still running a restaurant uh, in Minneapolis. And I think they both still take credit for teaching me uh, how to be successful in life. God bless their soul. Every time I'm back in Minneapolis, I go get a pizza from them. They're wonderful folks. Anyway, so, um, you know, that's where I started. Didn't have any lawyers in my family. Didn't have any business people in my family. I got an undergraduate degree in psychology, uh, psychology slash philosophy, and also environmental studies. Um, so, you know, so at some point I said to myself, what am I going to do for a living? I'm not one of these kids who grew up and understood I wanted to try cases and that was my calling and I had a family and a web of support around that. And I actually had a friend who was a couple years ahead of me in undergrad uh, who I uh, got to know really well and uh, being in school together and he went on to law school and said, you should really think about law school unless you want to go and, you know, be a philosophy professor, which I wasn't interested in. So that was what drug me into the profession and got me started thinking about being a lawyer. And I always associated trial work and being a stand on your stand up on your feet in the courtroom lawyer with what lawyers do. I didn't really understand what corporate lawyers did. And my corporate po partners will probably tell you, I still don't understand what they do, but that's OK. They don't know what I do either. So. Um, it was it was always what I thought lawyers did. I always remember being in law school and, you know, the OJ verdict came down when I was in evidence class. And that was one of those moments for me I'll never forget. And the, the varying responses to that verdict or something anyone who lived through that will remember. But it always stuck with me. And Johnny Cochran uh, was always a hero of mine, in part because of what he did in front of everybody in that case, uh, uh, in, in front of the whole world so effectively. Um, so that's a long winded way of kind of getting me to uh, how I got in the profession. I started in Minneapolis and I think I was really lucky to grow up as a lawyer in a smaller market because it gave me the opportunity to get in court a lot more than I think some of the lawyers of my generation were able to do on the coasts and in the bigger cities. And I tried my first pro bono case when I was a third or a fourth year lawyer and um, you know, I, I tell young lawyers this all the time. You have to find a way to to use that skill set if you want someone to identify you as someone who has the skill set. And so, you know, I, I think we spend a lot of time with our young lawyers on Zooms these days, and uh, they're answering a lot of emails. And for me, again, I think I was 
you know, you always think about a career trajectory in terms of opportunities, what opportunities you took advantage of, what things were available to you. And so that, you know, I also um, pretty, as I had a pretty young age, recognized that this was a self-driven profession and nobody at the law firm was sitting around wondering how I was going to get the next opportunity. So I was very, I was relatively aggressive about saying, do we have clients where we can get trial work? Do you have clients where I might try something that's below the belt of kind of our economic sweet spot, but Mr. Partner, you supervise me and I'm happy to do the work and happy to go do the arbitration or try the case. That worked out for me well. I spent time on my own as a young lawyer. I would I had identified the four or five trial lawyers I thought were the best in Minneapolis. And as a young lawyer, I would take time and go watch them in court. And, and that's you know something I don't see enough young lawyers having the gumption to kind of try to figure out and watch people and invest in that um, in that learning that you need uh, to be able to then develop your own skill set and your own style and to get up on your feet and do the effective things, do the things you need to do effectively in front of groups. So long-winded answer, but that, <laughs> I think those are some of the primary skill sets and foundational building blocks that, you know, 26 years of practice later have me trying cases like this, uh, this key case, we'll talk about in others. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm assuming how, how much of that kind of a lot of that grind, a lot of that work ethic you have comes from doing those things you did when you were younger, right? Doing the, doing the dishes and doing a lot of these other things that probably some people wouldn't, would not do, but it probably, I mean, did it give you that work ethic and that grind to say, I'm going to basically, I'm going to outwork everybody around me. It's absolutely right. You know, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, and I think quite frankly, it's a, it's an advantage for me relative to a lot of my peers you know, I might lose a case, but you will not outwork me. And that's one of the things I tell our team. And that's one of the things I teach. Know the facts better than anybody. Know the law better than anybody. See the problems coming before they before they show up. Think about how we're going to get around those problems before they show up. And if we lose the case, we lose the case. But it's not going to be because we were not the best prepared, the most focused, uh, and the most intelligent about the, the, the method of preparing to get us to a place where we can get up in on our feet in front of a courtroom full of jurors and and be compelling and persuasive. Yeah, and you know that hard work I'm sure paid off because you know as I as we were looking and I was I was you know hearing more about Will Stute, you were a National Law Journal winning litigator of the year in 2023, right? Yes, thank you. I'm very proud yeah. of that. Yeah, so like I said, all that hard work kind of come to fruition. So congratulations on that. Like, like many career trajectories, Mike, you know, I have four sons now, uh, which is part of the story I left off, but I've learned a lot from being a dad uh, as well. But, you know, they say, wow, dad, look at this. You, you won this big award in 2023. And I tell them all oh, 26 years of hard work to get there. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we, we hear that from entrepreneurs and founders these days all the time. And I think it's an important thing for young lawyers or young business people or young professionals in general to recognize is that none of this stuff happens overnight. And there's a lot of hard work that goes into foundation building to put you in a position to be able to, you know, to show up on the national scene very quickly. Yeah. And, and speaking about the national scene, this is really kind of how I came about and, and stumbled upon you was I was going through CBN had its most impressive defensive verdicts of 2022. And you were actually on that for your GI versus the NCAA uh, case. So can you talk to me a little bit about a uh, high level about what that case was? And uh, like you said, kind of we'll dive into a little bit more, but what's the 30,000 foot view of that case? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was a bellwether case for sports in general and college sports specifically. It was the very first case to go to a jury um, uh, that uh, involved allegations that the NCAA as an association and a governing sports body was negligent or somehow responsible for a former college football player who after death was diagnosed with what we know as chronic traumatic encephalopathy. If you've seen the movie Concussion with Will Smith, uh, that's what my case was all about, that, that particular case. And we've, we've handled a number of those for the NCAA and taken two of them to verdict actually over the last 16 months. But he was the first one and was a, you know, a bellwether case. There are several hundred other cases out there, many of them parked in a uh, MDL uh, awaiting decision on class cert. And then there's probably 30 more cases floating around the state court system right now going through the litigation process. So Bellwether case, very important foundationally for the system uh, of college sports that we have today. You know, and I'm curious, what was the decision, as you said, now it's a Bellwether case and you, you've actually taken two of them to trial. I mean, what was kind of the decision to take that to trial? 
you know, I, I saw a thing from from the that that actual case where there was a sports law professor that basically said this was a calculated risk by the NCAA taking this to trial, knowing that this could possibly be a bellwether case that could potentially provide a roadmap to hundreds or thousands of other plaintiffs. So I guess the question becomes, why take the risk? What what was it that made you want to take this to trial? Yeah, well, of course, those decisions are never just mine, right? So that's yeah. a collaborative process uh, with a very sophisticated client. But I don't think the professor is wrong. I mean, you know, every step in the litigation process is a strategic one. And so this was, I think, you know, like any case thought out very well and um, and a risk reward kind of risk, risk tolerance uh, was something we paid attention to. One of the problems, I think, for many mass tort, and this was essentially, this is essentially a mass tort claim and in many ways similar to the asbestos world in terms of the plaintiff's approach to it. And we can talk some more about that as well. Uh, but one of the, of the issues for any mass tort client, the NCAA or Johnson & Johnson or any of the other you know, cosmetic talc defendants these days, for example, is that you have so many potential plaintiffs and you have so many existing plaintiffs that you, uh, you of course you wanna make smart economic decisions, any client does, uh, and it in 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 some parts of the of the of the timeline of these kind of uh, mass tort cases, there's a time where settling a case for almost any money uh, sends a message to the marketplace that you are an easy target, and that you know you're going to settle cases, and so it's in their economic best interest to file as many cases as they can um, to get a quick settlement. And so you know I've I've been blessed to work with several clients over the course of my career, and the NCAA is one of them where you are in a position where you're comfortable with the litigation uh, strategy, you're comfortable with the company story, you're comfortable with your legal and factual defenses, but then you also have some pressure from the marketplace uh, to, not, uh, to not show vulnerability and to not be vulnerable. And sometimes settling makes you vulnerable to more cases. So again, combination of all those things uh, and, 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 we, and we took the, the case all the way through verdict. Yeah, I think it's interesting, you know, you. I'm not sure if you how much trucking litigation, if at all you do, but I think that's one thing that we see, you know, just from a general perspective for the audience is we see that a lot of that in the trucking industry too, where we're trying to get them to take more cases to verdict. To your point, the marketplace thinking you're vulnerable and the marketplace thinking, hey, you're just going to settle. So let's just keep hitting you. So I, I think that's a great approach. And, and I, I love that to try to hopefully get more people on the defense side starting to do that rather than just trying to look to settle cases. You know, it's an economic investment and an investment of time. I mean, we'll talk about, I'm sure, that some of the preparation that went into that key case. It was many years um, and lots of hard work. And, the, and to your point, I think one of the things I think defense lawyers forget a lot is how well coordinated the plaintiff's bar are. They share information seamlessly. They share it immediately. They share it effectively. They, were, they run in packs. And, they, and when they attack you, it's never just the lawyer you're facing and that you're dealing with on the other side of the V in, in any particular case, particularly in this mass tort world that I'm very familiar with these days, you know, so you have to be cognizant of that. Yeah, I guess, you know, now I want to kind of feed off of that a little bit, you know, from a defense perspective, like, what do you do? What do you think the defense bar should be doing? Because you're right, the plaintiff's bar is very coordinated, they share all the time, they're going through CLEs and sharing a lot of information and that you know, from a defense perspective, what do you think the defense bar needs to be doing more or should be doing more of? I think this, this you know, this tends to be a little more uh, client based, I think, in the defense world. So smart clients these days are forming and they have for many years forming groups of, te you know, teams of lawyers that all work together for them, you know, regardless of what law firm they're with. And I think, you know, I've, I've had the pl pleasure of working in several of these buckets over the years and you see that happen effectively. That's in the defense space, just quite frankly, that's often and almost exclusively driven by clients because it's always in law firm's best interest, and this is just the nature of our business, to own the, own the intellectual property around how to win cases. And so smart clients force that, I think, on uh, the business model that plaintiffs use on their defense counsel when they have enough of volume and a, and a big enough problem that they can and it makes sense to have several law firms working together and in those instances I think it works beautifully um, and and that's not to say the plaintiff's bar, bar is beneficent right they're doing that because it's in their economic interests as well so so that's where the business of law comes in but I, I think on the defense side I've seen it work most effectively and really effectively when you have coordinating counsel and litigation counsel working for a client or several clients on a particular issue. And they're very explicit about this. We expect our outside firms to share information. 
when you get an you get an email from somebody at another firm who's on our team, you respond to it just like they're uh, inside your own law firm. And that virtual law firm model works really well in the mass tort space, I think, to to drive value for the client beyond whichever law firm is handling any particular issue or case. Great. And I want to go back, like I said, we were talking about the the Guy case, you know, and how you worked it up, you know, kind of, t- kind of initially talked to me about what was the work up to trial? What was the amount of time that you spent? Because it sounds like obviously you're spending a lot of time preparing and you don't go into anything unprepared. So what did it look like trying to go into this case? So when I, you know, when I first got involved with this, the NCAA had just um, was well was still figuring out what to do with its class action. If you remember, the NFL had a had a CTE concussion class action, and it settled before any any case uh, went to trial. It was a class. They didn't fight the class cert issue. They just settled with the entire class. So there wasn't, you know, there was not a long line of history on those matters. But when when I got involved with the NCAA, it still had a class in this space, and it wanted, and, you know, the idea was. What, how do we deal with this and what do we do? And what they decided to do, and again, this is all in the public information filings and, and whatnot on the history here, so I'm not sharing anything out of school, but they settled that for a medical monitoring settlement, the class action that they were faced with. Um, and so that those funds that weren't to, um, uh, weren't to be distributed to anybody who claimed they were injured or harmed by playing college football or any other college sport, they were set aside to do some studying uh, and to set a baseline uh, of kind of medical uh, uh, knowledge and a, and, a, and, a, and a baseline of medical understanding about what CT is and what risks concussion play across sports. Then the question is, so what What after that? Because nobody was, you know, no individual plaintiff uh, or potential plaintiff was made right from that. And the setup there was much like what happens in many other areas. Pharma has done this in many instances and in other areas uh, similar to this where you have a potential mass tort exposure, the idea was that if they want to, um, you know, we think we have right off the bat, the thought was there, there are legitimate defenses to this organizationally, which we can talk about, which is a little bit more of, an, of a legal argument about what the NCAA's role is in sports versus the schools and the others who are involved in this ecosystem. But then also on the causation side, you've got some significant challenges for the plaintiffs as well. So the thought there was, you know, we'll get rid of the class action. We're not, but not uh, in a way that benefits or, or, or uh, I shouldn't say benefits, any, any way that compensates people who claim they were injured. And then they're going to have to sue us one at a time. What's going to happen? We're probably going to get a wave of individual cases, and then we're going to have to be prepared to deal with those. Uh, and so that was the strategy in settling their class action. And right from that point, you know, uh, very early on after that, class action settlement was uh, agreed upon and entered by the court, then you say, well, how are we going to defend the cases? You've got a hundred years of history here. You've got a hundred years of medical um, uh, discussion around concussion, head injury, physical injury, all of these issues. You've got a history and an arc of former employees at the association. Obviously, nobody who worked there in the early 1900s is still around. How are we going to tell the story if we're going to defend the cases? So there was a long period, and many were involved during that period, not just us, but we certainly were very involved in helping figure out how how to get people who could uh, tell that story compellingly, accurately, you know, knowledgeably, accurately, and, and, and you know, persuasively around all of these long arcing issues involving science, involving understanding of the medical the body of medical knowledge at any given period of time, because of course, state of the art is a big issue as you're discussing medical understanding going back a hundred years. So so none of the story had been developed, I guess is the big line takeaway. And and that had to be developed, understanding the documents, pulling them, figuring out what did we have, what didn't we have in terms of historical understanding and knowledge, getting your hands around all of that, and then working with the existing employees to develop some witnesses and some folks who could articulate all of these issues. You know, I started going through all these documents and, and, you know, looking at themes and trying to develop your themes. Did you do any sort of pre-trial research, focus group, mock trial, any of that type of stuff prior to? Much, much of it. You know, we did a full-blown mock jury study uh, in advance of the Gee case, Um, uh, a several-day process as anybody who tries cases will, will, will tell you about. Nothing special there, but we did that. 
and we learned a ton. You know, you lawyers are great at thinking, you know, this is one of the things I tell my my teams all the time. You know, we're all very smart. We're not selling to this story to to 12 other lawyers. This has to be compelling to 12 people off the street with a broad, broad variety of background, education, you know, knowledge, attitudes. And so the only way to decide whether what we are presenting is compelling, persuasive, uh, et cetera, is to, is to test that in front of a room full of 40 or 60 or whatever the number is, uh, potential, you know, jurors, and then go put them off into breakout rooms and hear how they deliberate. And so we learned a ton uh, through that process, as you, as I think you always do, and any trial lawyer will tell you, you always learn a ton. You might have the right shoes on, the right shoes on or the wrong shoes on as the trial lawyer, or your themes might be broken and you need to work on them. And, and it, it varies all the way from that most simplistic stuff, which sometimes you ignore, all the way up to, you know, we've got to really think hard about you know, our, our themes here and how we're presenting them. So you get all of that data and it's enormously valuable. Yeah. So I was going to say, I mean, did you find anything that, you know, and this always happens when, when we do this as well is something that you came in that thought, thought jurors were going to grasp onto, and then they completely didn't or vice versa, where you're like, wow, we didn't even think about that before. It was something minute, but it was something that was a strong driving point that you needed to then change and to develop your theme differently based upon the information you got. Yeah, you know, just taking a step back from Guy a little bit, and we'll abstract this a little just so we don't open the door into, into client discussions and, and yeah. s- specific themes here. But the answer is absolutely, you always do. Like for the reasons I suggested, lawyers work in an echo chamber sometimes, I, often. And the only other people we talk about the presentation with as we're preparing are other lawyers, and they're not the ones making the decision. So, you know, I think, you know, um, Causation was so important in these cases, and I think, you know, we'll get to the specifics of Gee a little bit here and what the jury found and some of the feedback we got from the jurors, but, you know, really crystallized for us, I think, the whole process, the mock jury experience, our lead up to trial and the trial presentation itself, that um, two things, I think, that were, were critically important in these cases. One was this particular individual died of something having nothing to do uh, with a, with a, a post-mortem post-death diagnosis of low-level CTE. This individual, unfortunately and tragically, died from a combination of a long history of drug abuse, a long history of alcohol abuse, morbid obesity, and some of the other problems that, unfortunately, health problems that a lot of individual people in our country and, and former football players all uh, you know, generally have a, have a tendency to suffer from. And that while CTE is a real thing, and this is another point, that came across throughout the whole process of this trial. We didn't deny, you know, the plaintiffs set this case up and they really tried to goad us into this argument that we don't believe in CTE. You know, they said in their opening, you're going to hear the NCAA get up here and say CTE is not a real thing. And we took the air out of that balloon immediately. We said, absolutely, CTE is a real thing. Science can't quite tell you yet what causes it or what, what causes it might have in a living person. That's the state of the science today, but the finding after death is absolutely a real thing. Um, And but it had nothing to do in this case and other cases with the with the unfortunate passing of this individual. Um, So that on the on causation, we really learned, I think, again, through the whole process from mock jury through the jury presentation and the feedback we got that that was critically important uh, to the decision makers, the ability to persuasively present what actually killed this person. Yeah. And I think, no, that probably would have been probably learned and it would have been nonsensical if you would have probably tried to deny the CTE based upon, you know, what I've seen to try from, from watching the trial and going back to watch the videos, that probably wouldn't have been very good based upon all the information that was presented. I mean, and you know, it's one of these things I think as a trial lawyer, you've got to remember is, you, you know, your, your ability to be persuasive is tied directly into uh, the kind of authentic believability and real realistic nature of your arguments. When, when you when you push a theory that has no connection to reality, not only are you going to lose on that theory, you're going to probably you know significantly increase the chance of that you lose the case entirely. Because once you do that a few times, I think you lose that connection with the fact finders, you know, with the jurors, and they don't trust you anymore, and and they don't believe you anymore. And once you once that happens, they're left to fend for themselves and try to figure this out. 
So, you know, it's not just a, uh, how do we position this to win the case? It's what, what is, what, what can we say that's going to ring true to the juries, to the jurors about this stuff? And I think once you get too far away from that, you're in big trouble as a trial lawyer. Yeah. You know, and I know we're kind of hopping around here a little bit, but this is, this is all, this is all good. You know, I'm talking about jurors uh, and jury selection, like how to, and, you know, we can talk a little bit about Guy, but like you said, you can go out and talk a little bit more just about how you approach jury selection, because, you know, we're always talking when we talk with attorneys that a lot of them have the way that they kind of do things. And then there's kind of the way that we view that they should be doing things. So kind of, how do you approach your jury selection process? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I picked the, we, we did the Gee case. I picked the jury in the Finnerty case, which was the next case uh, for the NCAA. After that, I picked the jury and I won a patent infringement case where we were defendant for a client called Zynga, which makes video games that you play on your, on your iPhone. And we won that, uh, we won that trial uh, in, in uh, Austin, Texas late last year. I picked the jury in that case. And I just got a mistrial in a case for uh, Johnson and Johnson in an asbestos tout case in New Orleans. I did the voir dire and picked the jury in that case. I really enjoy uh, doing the voir dire process. Uh, and and I, I, I think I'm good at it. I hope so. Uh, but but what I try to do uh, are a couple of things. First, it's your first chance to personalize yourself and your client in front of the jury. Obviously, you've got to understand your judge and what they how how you fit into that world. And some judges let you do a lot of it, and some judges have tight reins. So first, the first thing you have to do to be effective is understand what the zone that you can move around in on on board is with with your particular judge. So once you have that. Then I think you you know people when we say pick juries I actually think that's a misnomer. We're not picking people. We're trying to get rid of outliers. Uh, and I and I think you know I obviously part of this is fact dependent on the case, and you got to think really hard about which stereotypes of people and their experiences in life might be really bad for your case. You know, so for example, in my most recent case, um, you know, people who've been afflicted with cancer or have had you know somebody. In their family afflicted with cancer in the in the in the relatively near past, you know, they just bring a lot of emotion to a case involving someone who has mesothelioma. It makes it very difficult for them to be objective. So you take big pieces like that, and those, you know, those are relatively easy to find. And and then you, you know, use the system, whether it's preemptory strikes or or for cause or, you know, or or the other challenges that you might have. And then you really, I think you have to ask questions. What I see a lot of lawyers do is talk through Vordire a lot. Yeah. I try to shut up. It's not a cross examination, it's a direct exam. And the fewer words I say and the more information I can get those jurors who are reluctant and a little bit scared and they're in front of a big group. And so you've got to, you can't, um, you've got to be soft and very connective. And you have to get them talking, I think, to understand them and get way down in the nitty gritty of who you think for what reasons might be a bad choice uh, for your for your case. Um, but I, I think if I crystallize it down to one thing, I think it's that it's way more of a direct exam. And if you're cross examining people on board, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. No, I agree. And I guess the question, too, is how much time do you put into it? Because, you know, sometimes I know attorneys have their stock questions that they ask and then they go in there and ask, but I mean, how much thought do you put into each Vordire that you're doing for each different case? A ton, uh, you know, a ton of time. I usually work with a jury consultant. So, you you know, the first step is to get your written questionnaire uh, and that's the baseline. Half the time, you know, I toss it out based on what's actually happening. Um, and half the time, you know, you still use the questions, but I think it's a base. It's just like a, a, anything else in trial. You prepare like crazy. You understand the baseline of what you're trying to accomplish. And then you have to be able to react in real time in the moment to what you're hearing. So, you know, you can't have a script for anything in trial that you're that that you're wed to completely, because I think that you, now you're not an authentic person anymore and you lose jurors immediately. Once they get the sense you're tied to some scripts. Same thing with Vordire. Ton of time on the prep, ton of time understanding what the issues are, ton of time understanding who the panel might be, what's the background of a typical juror in federal or state court in this jurisdiction, what who am I dealing with here, what you know, it, it, you 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 bring all that in, you put it in the brain, and then you stand up and you react in real time to what's happening. 
Yeah. And I think it's one of those things too. You probably, like you say, you practice on, cause I think some people, you know, you can write the script and, and have the attorney do it, but they do it very dry and they do it very robotic versus having it flow. Yeah. You know, I, for me, everything has to be reduced. My, my team will tell you this and I drive them crazy. I just need a few bullet points. Like, and, and, you know, that's a process of, I have to, then you have to own it in your head. So it's a lot more work than reading a script, but, but I think that's essential. And again, it's your first opportunity in front of these, you know, in front of the jurors to personalize yourself, to make you a human being. You know, one of the things you have to not be in front of jurors is a, is a, is a quote unquote lawyer. Uh, of course, we're lawyers, but they have to see you as a person. Um, and if they don't, if there's no ability to connect with you, you're missing, uh, I think, one of the most important tools that you have in the courtroom. And that's your first chance to do it. So you've got to mix in what you have to get done, the questions that need to be asked and the information you need to get in with, you know, some, I usually tell a couple stories to personalize myself in every voir dire. And, you know, I haven't had a judge People always say a judge is going to get mad at you. I've never had a judge get mad at me yet. You know, obviously there's a there's a line and a spectrum of everything. If you turn it into the Will Studi show, you're going to get in, yourself in trouble with the judge. But a couple of vignettes mixed in with a legitimate question about you, where you come from, what your background is, something that will connect you with that with that juror. Um, you know, I said I think in both of the, our NCAA cases, one of the things I said in in voir dire or early, either in opening or at some point point early was to say, you know, I understand college sports. I have a son who plays division one basketball and you don't have to belabor it. You don't have to try to turn it into a theme of the case. It's not, um, but it helps jurors understand you as a person uh, and why you, and, and legitimizes you in some way in that, in the world that of the case that you're talking about. So you gotta be careful with all this stuff and there's a fine line here, but I think to be too scared of those lines is something that defense lawyers often uh, uh, are legitimately criticized for. Uh, plaintiffs' lawyers have no qualm about running up onto the line of, with all of this stuff, and and obviously, you know, you've you've got to understand your client. You've got to present things in a way that makes sense to them and doesn't. Um, you, obviously, you've got to follow the, all the rules as well. But to be too scared of this stuff, I think, does clients a disservice. Well, I think you know that's that's one thing I noticed about when I was watching your 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 closing arguments, but then also watching how you were objecting during closing arguments uh, during the Gee case, you were very aggressive into the point where, you know, you kept interrupting and, and plaintiff's counsel got frustrated with you and said, judge, you know, he keeps interrupting me. And you're, and you just said, but judge, you're, you're, you're getting the facts wrong. Like, but I think it was interesting. Has anyone ever said to you, like, will tone down that aggression, you know, or, or, I mean, I thought you were aggressive in a good way. I loved it. Um, and I wish more defense attorneys would do it. So I guess, have you, what do you, what's your thoughts on that? I, there's no, uh, there's, how do I say this? It's got to be context appropriate. So I, I think that closing argument, actually, I, I'll never forget this. What I said was, judge, tell him, tell him to stop making stuff up. Yeah. And the whole jury laughed. And they laughed because they recognized I was right, I think, at least in their view, that there were the, the over the top nature of the closing argument was, was really, really over the top in that case. And was undisconnected from the from the case that the jurors heard come in over the case of, uh, over the course of six weeks. So to be able to do that has to ring true for the jury, or you're going to find yourself on the wrong end of that. And I think in that particular moment, it did ring true for the jury. And there's you know a long story about that arc and why it made sense to say that in that moment. But I think you know um, the ability to make objections that the jury understands. I think is one of my superpowers, frankly. We all have a couple to be good at this. And I, you know, I think making um, objections during the course of a trial that the jury understands why you're making them, it makes sense to them, even if the judge doesn't agree with you, versus a technical argument that the jury has no idea what you're talking about. I think those that spectrum of those two things is an incredibly has an incredibly different effect on jurors. And to be able to do that well, I think I, I think it's one of the things I'm really good at. I enjoy it, and I think it's really effective. And I don't think enough defense lawyers do that. I mean, I, overall, I think jurors have to see some piece of this is not someone just doing their job and saying words as a defense lawyer. This is someone who believes the case that they're presenting. And I see that. You know, nobody ever says that or they don't talk about it. The jurors either internalize that or they don't. 
Um, and so for me, that was one of those moments I'll never forget in my career where I really felt like the jury understood exactly what I was saying. Yeah. And I think that's a good point. You know, when you think about a lot of times the defense bar, the defense attorneys can be too defensive, defensive, and they just come out and say, we didn't do anything wrong. We didn't do anything wrong. We didn't do anything wrong versus taking that more aggressive tone to your point, which I think is great is, you know, argue as hard, like plaintiff and believe in your case, plaintiff att attorneys are believing in their case. Therefore they're arguing versus defense attorneys need to believe in, believe in their case. So I think I believe you, maybe this is from raising four sons in sports, right? But, but uh, the best defense is a good offense and you have to find the places where you can legitimately be on offense. And, it, and again, it rings true and it's persuasive, but once you find those pieces, then I think in the right circumstance, a little bit of righteous indignation is not only you know, uh, not, not a problem, but it, it, it's, it can be very helpful. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that jurors, you know, how they, how they laughed in that situation and stuff. What was the feedback you got from, did you get a chance to talk to them afterwards? We did, you know, uh, some jurisdictions, you can't talk to them at all. Some you, you can, and this was a jurisdiction where we were able, if they were willing to talk to them and they, they were uh, the jurors in the Gee case and we, you know, the next case after that, which we also got a defense verdict in the Finnerty case in Indiana, both of those jury pools were actually very interested in talking to the lawyers on both sides, which is unusual. In my experience, usually when the judge says, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it's totally up to you. You can talk to these lawyers or you don't have to. They run, they don't talk to anybody and they leave. That's just human nature. And they've spent a lot of time on this. And, you know, oftentimes jurors don't want to talk. In these two cases, jurors were um, I would say maybe it's because there was so much press. That's part of it, perhaps. And they, you know, the judges in both of these cases really made the, the I think the jurors feel and, and accurately so that these were important cases for an important thing in society, which is sports. And th these are really, you know, both of these cases were precedent setting and really novel and unique and interesting. So I think they all felt a little bit like, wow, you know, I was just involved in something that was meaningful, so I want to share. But we got a lot of feedback from both of those jury pools. You know, I, I think, um, again, um, you know, setting aside some of the detail that, uh, uh, you know, that's difficult to talk about. I, I think they they did recognize some problems with the plaintiff's uh, presentation, and I think they shared that with the plaintiff's lawyers as well as us. Um, and I think they recognized some of the strengths in the defense presentation. I think we also learned some stuff, as probably the plaintiffs did, for the next round of these cases that would that may or may not be helpful. Again, it's always really hard to take too much away from a jury who's just decided a case, because every case is on its merits and, in fact, dependent on what happened during the course of the trial. But there are always some things that you have to be really thoughtful about going into the next um, the next series of cases. I suspect in this lot, in this, as I told you earlier, there are hundreds of these cases out there right now. Some of them are in an MDL. And if class cert does not get um, approved in the bellwethers in that MDL in Illinois, then there might be another wave of these trials. And there are a bunch of cases in the state court system now. So having said that, you know, you have to be thoughtful about what you're hearing and what you're learning and how to pivot because the plaintiff's bar certainly will. Back to the point you asked me earlier, they take all that data and they share it with all the other people who are involved in these cases. And there's a, a pretty broad group of people uh, pursuing these CT and, and concussion injury cases across the country. Yeah. And that was going to be one of my questions about whether or not you see that as, as a future of, of litigation, but it sounds like it's going to, uh, you know, and I guess, which means it has a lot of media coverage and the CBN trial. I mean, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this and then we'll wrap up, but just kind of from media perspective, what was that like? I mean, did you know the cameras in there? How did you handle that? Was there any thoughts that you had around cameras in the courtroom as far as, okay, I know this is being recorded. I need to adjust the way I do things or the messaging or any of that? Yeah, really interesting question. And uh, it's fun to be involved, obviously, as a trial lawyer in cases where you have this dynamic. So, you know, really, um, really fortunate for, to be in, in that situation in these cases. And I've had media coverage in the past of things I've done, but never this much. So, you know, in LA, in LA Superior Court, if you've ever been to that courthouse, you know, it's an old courthouse and there's a big, right across from the Disney stage there in downtown LA and there's a big wide street. First day of trial, there were 40, you know, media trucks parked in front of, uh, in front of the courthouse and reporters there, you know, Sports Illustrated was there, all the major, Bleacher Report was there, all the major sports uh, outlets were there, you know, you name it, and they were there. So I think as a, you know, you, you're always cognizant of uh, what, um, what the 
ramifications are of that much coverage. We knew CVN was going to cover the trial live, so that that part wasn't a surprise. And I, you know, I, how do I say this? You think about it, and but you don't. You have to present your case as you otherwise would. You can't be nervous about that, but you also have to be realistic about it, which is now everything we say and do is amplified. And when there's no media coverage, certainly courts are always a public proceeding and you have to be thoughtful and there's a record. So that's always there. But when there are that many cameras in the room and you know every time you turn your head, somebody's taking a bunch of photos of you at council table, which was the case, um, you just, you it, it, again, you think about it and yeah, then you have to forget it. Maybe it's like, I, sorry for another sports analogy, when my son is playing for South Carolina, you know, and the, and the media is there and the, and the South Carolina uh, stadium is packed with with fans. You just got to tune that out and go in your in your zone and 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 perform. But a lot of thought in advance of that, making sure with the witnesses as well. Um, you, you never want to make them nervous, but you have to prepare them for the reality that their picture is going to be taken. They can be quoted. You know, you, you, so it, it brings more pressure. But you just have to think about it intuitively, and then I think mostly let it go in the moment. Yeah, and you mentioned one other th one other thing is about witnesses, as far as your prep for witnesses for deposition and trial, how much time, because I think, you know, we, we talk a lot about it on the podcast about spending a lot of time with witnesses, preparing them for depositions and trials, you know, and sometimes it gets kind of pushed to the side or, or you do it an hour before and that kind of what is your thought as far as what you need to do in order to prepare your witnesses for both deposition and trial? You have to set them up to be successful. So you've got to, I spend a lot of time you know, obviously there's economic decisions and all the rest of it, but as, as much time as is reasonably possible to, to have your witnesses prepared. But a couple of things I think that are just as important, maybe like I talked about jury selection, you know, we're not really picking a jury, we're getting rid of bad jurors. Similarly with witness prep, I think lawyers have a tendency in my experience to talk too much in prep sessions. Get the witness talking, right? This is not a chance for me as the lawyer in fact, sometimes clients get mad at me when we're doing prep. I say, well, how do you not know that? I say, this is not my time to demonstrate to you what I know. This is the time for you to think about the stupid, asinine questions you're going to get that seem frustrating to you because people on the other side of the V, their job is not to understand this material. It's to make, to score points through you. So I may pretend I don't know something to see how you're responding to it. And, I, you know, so I think pretending to do the crosses are really important and, and not enough time is often spent on that. Obviously, direct is super important. And again, it's about, I think, as a lawyer, not resisting the temptation to talk a lot and to be the driver of the discussion and instead putting that witness in the position of practicing what they're going to actually do. Um, and you can also over prepare witnesses. So I, you know, I, I, I do think there's a real thing there to bring that authenticness in to the jury and have it not feel completely scripted. You can go too far. So there's a balance to strike there as well. But to me, the key is, you know, I'm not proving how smart I am as the lawyer. I'm, I'm getting this witness prepared to give accurate, compelling testimony that anticipates the problem so they can think about how they're going to deal with those in real time. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, and I think that's that's really good. I think not enough time gets spent, to, as you were saying, listening to witnesses. And that's what we harp on a lot, too, is, is let them talk. There's a lot of stuff that you can get gain from them. And you help build rapport with your witness, which then buys them and it gets them vested into the process. So I think that's that's great. You know, it's funny you say that. I mean, I, I can't tell you how how much the vibe between you and the wit, how how important that is. Um, you know, I've had a couple of experts who I just like in the last few years and who like me and, and, and you don't always have that, but when you do, that's an opportunity for the, for the jury to really see things zinging and shining. So, you know, I, again, this is, you have limited time and resources, obviously in any trial, but I, I tell lawyers all the time, if you can have a real rapport with an expert where you, where you, there's a, some flow there and, you know, that's always better. So some time spent, you know, developing that can, can be important when it works. Yeah. Well, well, I'd like to chit chat with you for a lot longer, but I know, I know you're a busy man, so I'm going to cut you loose here. Um, but I'm just, you know, how, how can people, how can clients, how can other attorneys get a hold of you, talk to you more about whether it's the gee case or just in general uh, about information, how do they get a hold of you? 
Yeah, and thank you for asking. And I, I try to be really selfless with that. Um, and so, you know, I can't take a gazillion calls like anybody, but I love to chop up strategy and talk about this stuff. So, you know, folks can reach me easily right on the ORC uh, uh, webpage, but my email address is wstute at auric.com. Um, but I'm right on the ORC uh, website as well. You know, my, my cell is, uh, and I, I give this out because I'm not scared to take some calls when they come. And I really do love chopping this stuff up. Uh, my cell number is 305-310-1964. So, you know, I think it's uh, one of the things we've lost a little bit of in my view. And again, I've been doing this 26 years is people, people just chopping stuff up, you know, Zooms are great and email is great, but to get on the phone with somebody or get in a room and just talk about strategy, whether or not you're involved in something, I think is one of the more fun parts of this profession. We don't do enough of it. So, um, so again, thank you for asking that question. And I, and I, and, and I welcome, I welcome those discussions. It's a lot of fun. All right. Thanks. Well, I appreciate it. You know, as always, Will Studi, this has been a, a great conversation. I appreciate you coming on, you know, go to the courtroom sciences website, all of our blogs, podcasts, all that information is up there. Feel free to reach out to me via email. This has been another edition of the Litigation Psychology Podcast brought to you by Courtroom Sciences.